Our last speaker, um, Dr. Jeff Weber, the head of our Comprehensive Melanoma Research Center that has really allowed us to carry out a lot of the basic and clinical research that you're going to hear talk about. Um, you've heard a lot of developments already, and uh, Dr. Weber is going to give you an outline of what the future might look like. Yep. So I'm going to take a totally different approach than what I've heard this morning. I'm going to give you the patient lay approach to what's going on in the melanoma field. So uh, we all know what the problem is. Many of you have been afflicted with it. Melanoma is a bad disease. And in fact, there was a fellow who was the chief physician at the Dana-Farber for many years. He's still there. He's a terrific guy named George Canellos. And he said, melanoma is the tumor that gives cancer a bad name. I actually met him a couple of years ago and said, was that exactly what you said? And he said, yes, that's exactly what I said. And it used to certainly be that way. As you heard from some of the speakers, things are looking a lot better. But we still have a long way to go. So much of what we do at Moffitt relates to manipulating the immune system. And what's the immune system? We've heard about these new drugs, but let's take a step back. Why do we have an immune system? Well, it's for protection. But what is it to protect you against? To be honest, most it evolved as protection against bacterial infection. And we have different mechanisms. It is a very complex system. And you have innate immunity, and you have adaptive immunity. And you have cells, and you have lots of different chemicals. And again, we have an innate immune system. Innate, what does that mean? It's sort of pre-existing. And it's ready to respond to infection, inflammation, or tumors. And it's like a booby trap. It's there, it's preset, and if you stimulate it the right way, it's sprung like a booby trap. We have cells in the bloodstream. You've heard about neutrophils, white cells, leukocytes, macrophages. Those are all cells of the innate immune system. It's not educated. It's not particularly selective. The cells kind of kill first and then ask questions later. And it's essential to protect you against uh, a cut, which might get infected, or God knows what would happen to it, but you want those cells right there at the time to take care of clearing the potential infection. The other side of the coin is adaptive immunity. What does adaptive mean? It means it can learn. They are mostly cells, and we have B cells and we have T cells. The B cells make antibodies, which are chemicals. The T cells do things. They can kill the tumors. They can kill virally infected cells. And they're educated, and they can learn. That means they have a memory, and they can have what's called a recall response. So if you expose your immune cells to a virus or a bacteria five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, they're still hanging out. They're called memory cells, and they just sort of hang out in your bloodstream. And there aren't too many of them, but you don't need many, because as soon as you get exposed to the infection, or it could be a cancer, all of a sudden they'll start growing and proliferating. They'll remember, ah, I saw that seven years ago. Let's go in there and kill it. They are very specific, and they have a very selective action. So if you had anti-flu T cells eight years ago because you had a flu infection, they're not going to recognize uh, a shingles infection. It had nothing to do with it. So you could have a great flu set of T cells, but you might be able to get a shingles infection because you don't have great herpes oster T cells. And the immune system, we always joke, is like the Department of Defense. And the immune system is very elaborate. It, sucks up huge amount of energy effort within your body. And it's mostly designed for defense against bacteria and viruses, not cancer. And the military is pretty elaborately constructed for defense. It takes up a huge portion of our budget, and it's there to protect us against all kinds of bad guys. This week, the bad guys are the North Koreans. God knows who it's going to be next week. But the immune system has innate and adaptive branches. The Department of Defense has the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, and they all have different functions, and they all work generally together. Immunity functions with a simultaneous attack. If you get an infection or if you develop a, a metastasis of a tumor, when it works, the immune system piles on all at once. You have an innate attack and you have an adaptive attack. And the military has an all-arms attack. They pile on with artillery, airplanes, ground forces. And the tumor cells, by the way, are very good at evading and, and avoiding the immune system. They are very clever. They evolve over your lifetime in the same way that organisms evolve over thousands of years. Over your lifetime, when you get a tumor, the tumor evolves, which is not a good thing. 
And similarly, the enemy, the Department of Defense's enemies, use stealth, they camouflage things, they jam radars. Actually, these days, I guess they do cyber attacks on our computers just to avoid detection and destruction. So there are a lot of similarities between your immune system and the Department of Defense. Immunes, immunity works pretty well against infection. Most of us are reasonably healthy. Relatively few people in the 21st century die of infection, although it can still happen. 200 years ago, it was very different. Most people died of infection or trauma. 10,000 years ago, everybody died of infection or trauma. Lifespan was in the late 30s. Today, obviously, it's a lot different. I think the lifespan is in the late 70s today for most folks. But it's awful tough to have an immune attack against cancer cells because they're all derived from normal cells and they often differ only in a relatively small number of genes. So they look kind of like our normal cells. And they can evolve very quickly. As I said, during the lifetime of a cancer, in our lifetimes, the cancer cells can lose expression of the things that could provoke recognition by the immune system. And the cancer cells are pretty darn clever. They can evolve to produce things that suppress the immune system, just like the bad guys can produce suppressive substances to avoid getting bombed. The tumor cells can suppress the immune system. And patients who are sick with cancer who get lots of chemotherapy and lots of other therapy have very suppressed immune systems. They just don't work very well. So what's the problem? Let's face it, the immune system in humans did not evolve to attack cancer. It evolved to get rid of infection, which was the greatest risk in prehistoric times because we had short lifespans. Most cancers occur in the fourth decade or later. It's very rare to have someone ill with cancer before you're 40. It happens, it's just not common. The older we get, the greater the risk of cancer. So if humans never lived to the age of 40 or 50 until the last couple of hundred years, we never evolved to have a very good immune system to get rid of cancer. So manipulating it is very difficult. But we have certainly had some serious success. For example, Mike Atkins told you about this antibody called ipilimumab. And what it does is, up here, this red stuff binds to substances. So here's the immune cell. That's the killer cell. That's the good guy. Here's the bad guy. That's the tumor cell. For the good guy to recognize and kill the bad guy takes a whole bunch of connections. It takes something on the immune cell called the T-cell receptor or the TCR to recognize something on the tumor cell. And it takes all this other stuff to link up to make it a nice connection. And when that connection is made, whammo, it kills the tumor cell. Well, the problem is if the tumor cell or it's part of the immune cell is making lots of stuff called CTLA-4, it links up real fine, but what it does is it suppresses the immune response. So if your immune cells are making too much CTLA-4, you've hit the brake too much, and it's not going to work. But if you had this antibody that Mike described, this ipilimumab, which is an anti-CTLA-4 antibody, it binds to this substance on the immune cell, sucks it up, prevents it from hitting the brake, and the accelerator can work in an unfettered manner. And that works because Mike showed you the data and survival is prolonged in melanoma patients and actually patients with some other malignancies. What we've done at Moffitt and what's more contemporary and new is there's yet another substance called PD-1. It stands for Program Death 1, terrible name. And actually in mice, it actually promotes the program death of immune cells because you don't want your immune cells to live forever. Like if you get a flu infection and you get zillions and zillions of immune cells against flu, something has to stop it, right? Or else they're just going to grow and grow and grow and take over your body, as Bruno implied a little while ago. So you need an accelerator and you need a brake. And in any complicated vehicle, actually you have redundant brakes. I think today in cars, they're all built with redundant brake systems. There's not just one, because if one fails, you have the other. In human bodies, we have lots of redundancy. We have two kidneys, we have two lungs, etc., etc. So the immune system has redundancy. It's got one break, that's CTLA-4, and it's got another one. It's called PD-1. It's good to have a break. You want to be able to stop the car. The problem is, in a viral infection or in cancer, there's too much PD-1 on the immune cell. And perversely, the tumor cell can often express a substance called PD-L1. L means ligand. The ligand is something that binds to a receptor. So if the tumor cell has the PDL1 that binds to the PD1, it kills the tumor cell. It programs its death. 
which is a little bit of a misnomer in humans. It doesn't kill it. It just puts it to sleep. It has a name. It's called immune exhaustion. So it exhausts the immune cell. It's like a loop dish, dish rag, and it doesn't function. It doesn't die. It's just not working. And if it's not working, it's not going to get rid of the tumor. So if you could block it, like with an antibody, like with that CPLA4 antibody, you would unexhaust or refresh the immune cells, and in animals, they then start killing the tumor. So at Moffitt, we have pioneered in testing that antibody. And here's kind of the conceptual scheme. The immune system needs an accelerator and a brake. So when you turn on the ignition in the car, the T cell recognizes with its receptor that which it's specific for. Press the accelerator, that's the CD28 B7, those are the two things that link together. It's called co-stimulation. You can block it with CKLA4, but when you add the antibody, you allow it to proceed unfettered and you can actually accelerate. These are the brakes. Obviously, you have an accelerator and a brake, right? If you cut the brake, sometimes giving that antibody is like cutting the brake, which means the car can drive really well. The problem is stopping the car can be a little bit of a tough chore. And you can steer the car, and steering it means you're probably going to give it some sort of effort where you're going to slant the immune response in one direction or another, and that would be a cancer vaccine if they work. So, CTLA-4 works. You can cut the brake cable, and Mike showed it to you. We've seen very good responses in our cancer patients. But as Mike also showed you, and I think he showed something like it, you can get these weird phenomena. So in taking care of patients who get this ipilimumab, this CTLA-4 antibody, we have to deal with weird responses. Here's a patient who starts out getting ipilimumab, and this is from a colleague of mine who's at Memorial, Jed Walchok. The patient gets four doses of this antibody. It's cutting the break on the immune system, so it's letting it work. Well, it didn't really work. I think any one of you who looks across the room would admit in the liver of this patient, there are now all these things which are all tumors. Well, that's not good news. And the patient was being prepared to get the next therapy. Well, during that time, they had to wait, and it ended up being an eight-week wait, right? Week 12 to week 20 was a long wait. They were about to put the patient on a new trial, and they got a new scan, and lo and behold, I think it's pretty obvious, the black splotches are now little black dots. And they said, whoa, we're not going to treat this fellow. We're going to wait. And they waited, and they waited. And actually, this is a patient still alive five years later, actually a history teacher in New York City, who has had a complete remission of his disease. It just all went away. And this is the immune system at work. It took, my God, three months to get it to start working. It ain't chemotherapy. When you give chemotherapy, it either works or it doesn't within six weeks. With immunologic stimulation like we work with here, it can take months. Now, that's okay if the patient's doing well for that period of three months. But this makes life very difficult for the patient and the oncologist because, as in the song, you have to know when to hold and when to fold. I think it's The Gambler by Kenny Rogers, which is one of our favorite songs. And in that song, there's a line, and it says you have to know when to hold and when to fold. You're playing a high-stakes game of poker. So what should you have done here? Should you have immediately put the patient on to another treatment? Well, ironically, they held. They didn't fold, and they were rewarded. So this gets life to be very difficult. On the other hand, Mike also alluded to some of the unusual effects of these antibodies. And it turns out that you can inflame organs when you give these immunologic stimulants. These are unique side effects. Some of them don't even exist in the state of nature, meaning they had been unheard of, essentially, until we started cutting the break on the immune system. And we can see bizarre inflammation of the colon, we can see swelling of the lymph nodes, which are not pathologic. They just swell up and they're normal, and it drives us crazy. We biopsy them and they're all normal. And it drives the patients crazy because they think they're progressing. And bizarrely enough, the side effects were associated in some cases with benefit to the patient. So here's a side effect that didn't exist in the state of nature, essentially, until we started using these antibodies to boost immunity. The pituitary is a little gland at the base of your brain. It's about the size of your pinky nail. That is very small. Seven millimeters, size of my pinky nail. That's the baseline. The patient then gets treated with this immune stimulant that cuts the break on the immune system, and now it's like twice the size. Maybe it's the size of my thumbnail. Not much bigger, but this patient had the worst headache of his or her life, had horrendous fatigue, was really sick, and it turned out the drug knocked out the pituitary. The pituitary wasn't working. 
it was inflamed, and you don't inflame the pituitary in the state of nature. It doesn't happen. Pregnant women can infarct the pituitary. That's called Sheehan syndrome. It's not an uncommon thing. But that just kills the pituitary because the blood supply is killed. This is inflammatory. You inflame it. Bizarrely enough, it's associated with benefit for the patient. Now, the patient gets well because you just give them pills to take off the steroids they weren't making. But this is what happened, and this is an interesting, somewhat controversial concept. The patients who get these inflammatory side effects are here, and this is survival after treatment. And those who don't, are here. Obviously, I'd rather be on the yellow line than on the blue line. So there appears to be an association between getting these weird immune effects and doing well. And that, again, in the history of oncology is almost unheard of. So, again, unique thing to these immune drugs. So, what are the other immune breaks? I already told you the second break, in addition to CPLA-4, is called PD-1. And again, it's a redundant break mechanism. The PD-1 antibody has been extensively tested here. We've probably treated more melanoma patients with that drug than anyone in the world. And it appears to have fewer side effects than the drug Mike Atkins told you about, this anti-CPLA-4 ipilimumab. And it's kind of more like a sniper rifle rather than the shotgun, which is what the ipilimumab is. And what I tell patients is, when I talk about a comparison, I say it's like the light beer commercial from Miller. Remember the commercial, it's great taste, less filling? Well, it's great effect because it has twice the response rate of ipilimumab, and it's less toxic. So it's kind of like the light beer commercial, and it's a very good drug because here's what can happen. Here's a patient who gets the antibody in an early trial. This has already been published. Big thing on the shoulder starts to shrink, and guess what happens to the tumor? There's an influx of immune cells which are stained with that red stain. There ain't too many immune cells here, which is why the tumor's growing. All of a sudden, the immune cells start influxing into the tumor, and they're still there, they're still there, and the tumor starts shrinking, and eventually almost completely goes away. No big surprise. Here's a patient of ours who failed all kinds of different treatments. Failed lymphocyte therapy, which I'll talk about in a minute. Failed the polymomab. And the thought was, if you had it, the limomab, it might be dangerous to give another drug that cuts the break because it might cause really bad immune effects. Well, not true. We showed that that wasn't true. And here was the patient with this big thing in the lungs and all this junk up here. Twelve weeks later, almost all gone. So that's pretty good. And we were the first to show that you could take patients who failed ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 antibody, and then give the new antibody and cut the break yet again and induce significant remissions. And that's actually been written up and it's already been submitted to the New England Journal and we'll hopefully find out next week if it gets in. And it can go the other way. We've given patients this antibody and have progression of disease. And if you look here, all this junk here on this side of the lung, it's all tumor. This was a 17-year-old kid who had significant progression of disease surrounding the lung, almost no normal lung left. After getting the antibody, he was very sick. We then gave ipilimumab, the CPLA-4 antibody, and almost all of it went away and stayed away for a whole year. So you can give one antibody and they can progress and they may respond to the other. Or you can go the other way. And actually what we're doing at Moffitt is we're doing them in sequence. So we have a trial that starts next month where you give one antibody and then you give the other antibody. And then you go back to the original antibody. So you sandwich it or sequence it on the idea that if you don't respond to one, you have a good chance of responding to the other. Add them together, it's about a 50% response rate, and that's not bad. Now, there are multiple antibodies against this PD-1. BMS makes one, and we work with that. There's one from Merck, and several of the folks who talked told you about these swim plots. So these are the plots which show shrinkage of disease. If you're below the origin, they shrink. If it goes up, it grew. And this is a pretty darn good record because a good proportion, about a third of the patients, have shrinkage of their tumor with this other PD-1 antibody. So it says it wasn't a fluke. There are multiple antibodies against this PD-1. They all seem to work. And not only do they work, they work well. And not only do they work well, when the tumors shrink, they stay shrunk. Of the 22 patients we treated on a trial with 90 patients treated who responded, so 22 responders above a certain point out of, I think it was 87 total patients. 18 of them stay in remission six to 12 months later, and they continue and continue and continue. 
So that means the average patient's probably going to stay in remission well over a year, which is as good as any treatment I've ever seen for melanoma. So that's good news. So what do we conclude about this antibody? It's going to be a great addition to the armamentarium. The response rates are anywhere from 25 to 40 percent. That's not bad for a single drug. A lot of the responses last a long time, and we're going to find out if we can give it simultaneously with or sequentially with this other blocker of the immune, uh, immune suppression, ipilimumab, which Mike Atkins told you about. So let me end up by giving you some more information. So that was pretty encouraging. PD-1 looks very good. That drug is now in phase three trials, which means you're testing it head to head against the standard. And if that drug doesn't get approved, I'll be very surprised. And you'll know in about two years, I'd say, and we'll play a major role in getting this drug approved because many, many patients with melanoma have been treated with that drug in Moffitt. Adoptive cell therapy is when you isolate the immune cells, the T cells, either out of the blood or from a tumor. And when I say from a tumor, you actually have the surgeon remove the tumor. They chop it up with a little scalpel into little bits, literally a millimeter in size. And you actually put them in a plate, throw in some liquid media to nourish the cells, and you add something called interleukin-2, which Mike Atkins talked about, which nourishes the immune cells. And they literally, the immune cells will escape from the little bit of tumor. They literally migrate out. They move. They, can, they have the capacity to move along the plastic. They kill the tumor, freed of the influence of the tumor. They explode, expand, and they go from 1 million to 1 billion. So it's a thousand-fold increase in about a month. That's a lot. So you feed them. You give them this nourishing stuff with interleukin-2. You give them a little antibody to stimulate them. And then eventually you grow them to literally 100 billion. So that's 10 to the 11 cells. That's a lot of cells. And you give them back to the patient in the veins. And it's not as simple as that because to grow 100 billion cells takes six incubators that look like this. And these are bags. This bag is about the size of a business envelope, an 8.5 by 11 envelope, a little bigger. And it's filled with a liter. It's over a quart of fluid with the cells. And you got a total of 10 places in this incubator. They're like 60 bags, so that's six incubators worth that look like this. And this is about the size of your washing machine. And it kind of looks like a washing machine, actually. So you got six of these washing machine-sized things. It costs a lot of money and time, and you eventually expand the cells over about a month. And you give the patients chemotherapy. Why? Not to shrink the tumor. It's a kind of chemo that has no impact on the tumor. It kills your immune system temporarily. All the immune cells are wiped out. They're gone to zero for about three weeks. Then you give these cells that you're growing back. They populate the patient. Many of them are anti-tumor cells. Then you give interleukin-2 to stimulate them and make them grow, and then you stop. And that sounds pretty complicated, but you can have some pretty ugly, yucky-looking tumors like this that can just shrink and shrivel away with this treatment. This was originally pioneered at the National Cancer Institute, and ironically, I was a fellow there when the first patient was treated with this kind of treatment a long, long time ago. And over the last 20 years, it's been adapted, expanded, and refined so that when it was first used with this chemotherapy in the way we now grow the cells, they had 35 patients, and they had three complete shrinkages and 15 partial shrinkages. That ain't bad. That's a 51% response rate. And you could see dramatic stuff going on. And over time, if you gave this chemo to wipe out the immune system, you did better than if you didn't give the chemo. And this is a survival curve over a pretty long period of time. That's five years. If you gave radiation and chemo, you did even better. Because look where the survival is. It's way up there. So now you're getting into some serious survival curves. And you can see some very impressive shrinkage with this treatment. And we do this at Moffitt. It's only done at three places in the U.S. Here, MD Anderson and the National Cancer Institute, and Emot Sarnayak, who's a surgical colleague, is the quarterback of this. And the kinds of stuff you can see are, look at this liver riddled with tumor. I mean, that is bad, bad, bad. A month later, almost complete clearance after getting the cells with the chemo in the aisle, too. You can even have brain metastases with the arrow that go away. You can have a hundred subcutaneous nodules. This is like, oh my God, this is like five centimeters poking out from the abdominal wall. Almost complete clearance. So you can see dramatic responses. And interestingly, if you want to take out the tumor and grow the cells, 
what we do at Moffitt and what Dr. Sarnayak has done is he gives a treatment before the harvesting of the tumor. So we call the removal of the tumor the harvest. And as you can imagine, the more immune cells in the tumor, the better they're going to grow and the more cells they get. So here's what he does. And this comes from a talk given at our big meeting, the ASCO meeting last year. And it's, I'll just show you the picture. Ipilimumab is that CPLA4 antibody that Dr. Atkins talked about. What he didn't mention is that when you give the antibody, this is before and this is after, guess what happens? These are the immune cells, stained and brown, and the same thing up here. There are very few of them here. There is a ton of them here. So he gives a dose of the antibody before the harvest to accomplish getting a huge increase in the infiltration of the tumor with these immune cells. Then he harvests it, then he grows them, and they can grow the cells a lot faster, easier, and they may well be more active if you pre-treat the tumor with this anti-CKLA4 antibody. And this just shows pre and post, and this is a study that was done in Pittsburgh, which we picked up on, to try and adapt what we do and make it better. And as further evidence that it's a good idea, here's a survival curve from my old colleagues at the MCI. They compared survival. And by the way, look at look how far out we go. Oh my God, this is like nine years. They went out a long time, and they asked, if you got that antibody that I just showed you increases the immune cells into the tumor, if you got that before you got the TIL, the lymphocyte therapy, did they do the same? Did they do better? Well, it's a rigged answer. Obviously, they did better. You get the antibody, look how well you did compared to everybody else. So the implication is, if you give the antibody first, then you harvest the tumor, then you give the lymphocytes, you may do better than if you don't give the antibody. And Dr. Sarnayak is testing that as we speak. Lastly, Mike Atkins already talked about this. He talked about this BRAF mutation, and I'm going to do one thing. I'm just going to show you the results of a trial where we were the biggest contributor at Moffitt to a large international trial. We put more patients on than anyone else. And he mentioned to you this BRAF inhibitor with this other drug, this MEK inhibitor. Let me just show you, since I'm just about out of time, in the trial that we were the biggest contributors, look at the response rate. When you combine the two drugs, which are both pills that are targeted drugs, they have nothing to do with the immune system, they're completely separate, you do better with the combo at a high dose of the combination than with a low dose of the combination for only the single BRAF inhibitor. And we think that has a lot of promise. Mike showed you some other data. That combination, if that doesn't get approved in the next year or two, I'll be very surprised. So, and then finally, he didn't show you this. This is the best waterfall plot I've ever seen. Almost everybody responds. And if you look at the rate of response, which is the number of bars that go up to the dotted line, it's three quarters. That's as good as I've ever seen in melanoma. So, I'm out of time. Let me just give you the conclusions. The immune system, which is an amazingly complex organism, can be manipulated to treat cancer. Mike showed you this ipilimumab data. I showed you the PD-1 antibody, which looks very promising with a 25 to 30 percent response rate in our patients. If you had ipilimumab before, you can still have the same response rate as if you never had ipilimumab. It doesn't increase the side effects, which everybody was afraid of. These new antibodies that shut the immune or cut the immune break were very promising. There are new ones coming up the pipe. It turns out there are at least five or six breaks on the immune system and five or six accelerators. Each break plays a different role so that if you cut the PD-1, if you cut the CPLA-4, you may be able to cut other ones with antibodies called LAG-3 or TIM-3. So it's going to keep me employed till I retire. <laughs> which I hope is a long time. And the transfer of these tumor-killing immune cells by this adaptive transfer is a coming field. We're one of only three places in the U.S. that do it. And again, what Mike told you, what Jeff told you already, what Raggy told you, these drugs that target melanoma growth pathways are very promising. We're trying to figure out how to mix and match them. As Mike implied, the first trial where you matched the vemurafenib, the BRAF inhibitor, with the ipilimumab was a real problem, horrendous toxicity. Because whatever you add to ipilimumab causes unexpected side effects. So you really have to be on your toes. But we're now mixing and matching the IPI with the Mozart trial with those lymphocytes. And we think that's going to be a good bet. So I am up in time, and I think we're ready for a panel discussion.